has been said and done, Naomi, about the business case. But when we look at the life cycle of what are we really trying to influence, there's just no question that when you look at business outcomes through the lens of why do great technology companies, why are you seeing the kind of focus you're seeing from Silicon Valley and from all over? It's because they are acknowledging that the customer base is changing that women are the major consumers, and they're not just now the consumers of healthcare and financial services and other consumer products, but they're one of the fastest growing cadres of consumers of technology. So I think our clients are starting to understand that if you do not have women strategically integrated in product development and product management and innovation and sales, and you're actually selling to women, how can you predict how your customers are going to think and feel? If you can't increase the participation rates of women in the workforce, then if you look at your future GDP growth, economic growth and vitality, you will, as a country, be on an economic decline because you simply do not have the workers, what we call worker replacement ratios. In a country like Japan, if they cannot figure out how to bring more women in, both as workers and consumers, they will actually shrink as an economy. So at a very macro level, we look at this, Naomi, and say, look, we're talking about an asset, right? An economic asset. Women represent, the la women, educated women not in the workforce represent a, G a potential GDP increase of about 12 trillion. There's a talent pool out there that we cannot afford to waste. Absolutely. And, uh, your point about Japan is an interesting one because from my reading, women do, educated women do enter the workforce, but at the point of childbearing, leave and often don't return. Is that a problem across the world or is that unique? It's a combination of what are truly the programs and policies that countries and companies have, but then who takes advantage of those policies and what is the culture? So if you compared, why are we seeing women deeply and truly thrive in the Nordics, right? If you look at where do we actually think we are truly going to see some form of gender parity, and could be in my lifetime, high probability that we will see it in Denmark, in Sweden, in Norway. Why? Because men and women take equal advantage of leave, of fraternity leave, of work remotely, of flex work. So the culture embraces this as a, as a people and family issue, not a woman issue. I think it's fair to say if I had colleagues on from Japan and some of the, some of the uh, organizations we work with, it's, they've done everything. They've legislated, they have great you know, mandates on childcare, but the culture hasn't caught up with the economic imperative. So you can have the CEOs of great companies and some amazing Japanese multinationals very focused on this, but the culture isn't really aligning and the men aren't embracing yet the strategy. If there aren't enough women like you and me in positions um, of some responsibility in a company, then often the senior male executives don't have the experience of working with senior women. And that's why I think it's so important that men not see this as she wins, I don't, but rather Absolutely. we all win together. And I think that comes out of working together, gaining the experience. Um, are there some programs that are particularly helpful with giving rising men and women as they come up the career ladder the opportunity to really collaborate? Just on a personal level, I have been the, you know, as a senior executive at Mercer, I've been the executive sponsor of women at Mercer for five years. And why does that matter? Because women across Mercer and men see me actively engaged in understanding, look, what's our brand? Why are women coming here? Why do they leave? What is it we need to do? And this year, actually two years ago, I decided that it, I needed to have a co-sponsor and I picked a phenomenal guy um, who runs our global talent business and said, look, Ilya, you've got to get the men much more engaged in this. And he started an entire strategy on men matter. So he did 
phenomenal sessions with our male partners, with our uh, male executives. And we found out, Michael, a lot about men wanted a safe place to say, what's the deal with all this women's stuff? You know, why are we talking about this? I, you know, and, and when we showed them the data and said, you think you're doing a great job, but honestly, here's what's happening to your women. Here's where they fall behind from a pay equity to it, to a person. They were like, that is not acceptable. But you needed the men honestly saying, is it safe to talk? Like, I don't get why this is such an issue. I think I'm a really flexible supervisor. Well, actually, you're really not. You've never told the women on your team that they can work remotely one day a week. What practical steps can they take? How do you do it? I would say that the very practical things we say to clients are first and foremost, diagnose your root cause. You have got to understand in a, and not just at an aggregate level, if you're, you know, if you've got multiple regions and businesses teaching your executives how to diagnose, what is the problem you have? Are you not hiring enough women? Are you not promoting them at the right rates? Are you actually losing them at certain career levels? Where are they falling behind? Absolutely critical that you got you know what problem you're trying to solve. So the first very practical thing is given the great developments in workforce and data analytics, it's really easy to figure that out. So get the data. Um, second thing we really say very practically is engage the key stakeholders. And again, not using jargon, but look, it just can't be the CEO. Right, You need to find passionate leaders from the CEO to the senior executive all the way down the line and say, look, are you willing to make a personal commitment to lead and champion this issue? Not because it's the right thing to do, but it's because it's going to make your business and society more successful. So you need authentic people who actually can really lead and say, this is how this is going to make our business more successful. And then I really think you got to take action. You know, you got to really say, look, there are a half a dozen world class programs that we know make a difference. Sponsorship is critical. Men matter programs, really making sure the two big things that we saw that had the biggest impact on future representation of women were health and financial wellness programs focused on women. So understand, are your women experiencing stress and the healthcare system differently? Do they need a different way to be educated financially? So we find that, you know, those programs make a huge difference, but then also make sure that you've got an infrastructure that's going to let you persevere. Because one of the things, certainly Naomi, you and I talk about is this can't be key person dependent. I am absolutely confident that if I left Mercer tomorrow or if Julio Porto Latin left, we would continue to thrive on our women's agenda because we built the sustaining infrastructure. So diagnose your problem, get the right leaders, find out and weed out the people who are not authentic. I would honestly challenge you, if you have leaders who really don't believe this, I question why they're leading in this day and age, but then make sure that you really understand which of these programs that move the needle and absolutely make sure that you can persevere because you've got the right muscle. And I actually think we've got a lot of clients that are doing that. Naomi, what are some of the other steps that companies can take? I, I get this question all the time. And um, I think one very practical step that companies can take tomorrow is to a point that Pat was making, they have to look beyond the aggregate data. They have to right. look at the data for individual managers, individual product lines, individual geographies and so forth, because it's at that point of sale, it's with that manager where you change things, you change behavior. And to Pat's point, if you have some people on board who are really not with the program, managers who really don't believe in this and really aren't gonna do it, then you need to get them out of the way. Thank you.